So Simon Grayson has lost his job as Sunderland boss. A club without a home win during the entirety of 2017 so far, the Black Cats drew 3-3 with Bolton Wanderers on Tuesday night, the only team below them in the championship before kick-off. The failure to beat Bolton saw the end of Grayson's tenure, who had the seemingly impossible task of steadying a Sunderland side that were on the brink of sinking. Grayson was Sunderland's 8th permanent manager since November 2011, showing just how unstable the Wearside club have been. But did all of their past 8 managers deserve the sack? Let's take a look. We'll begin with Steve Bruce, who managed Sunderland between June 2009 and November 2011. The former Manchester United centre-half was brought in after the Black Cats narrowly avoided relegation the season before and quickly steadied the ship, finishing 13th in his first season, then guiding them to their first top-half finish since the Peter Reid days, putting together an exciting team with the likes of Darren Bent, Danny Welbeck and Asamo Jean. However, things fell apart at the start of his third season in charge, and after a terrible start that saw them in 16th place in November, the fans turned on Brucey, and a last-minute defeat to Wigan at home was the final straw, and Bruce was a goner. He blamed his sighting on his Newcastle roots and not resonating with the fans, and while that probably wasn't true, the club haven't progressed since they relieved Bruce of his duties, suggesting maybe it was a little too early to get rid of him. Next in charge was Martin O'Neill, who managed Sunderland between November 2011 and March 2013. A popular appointment with fans as O'Neill grew up as a Sunderland fan, O'Neill quickly got to grips with the task of the Stadium of Light and had them competing for a top half and potential Europa League place until no wins in their final 8 games saw them finish 13th, still a respectable position after a rough start. The following season, O'Neill spent relatively big money on the likes of Stephen Fletcher and Adam Johnson, looking to launch an assault on the Premier League top 10. However, his negative and dated tactics had them just a point above the relegation zone with 7 games to play and the Sunderland board acted quickly by sacking the childhood supporter. Did O'Neill deserve it? Maybe not, but the price of Premier League football meant the Sunderland board didn't want to take a risk and there wasn't much longevity in the kind of football that O'Neill was playing, so he wouldn't have lasted too much longer anyway. His replacement was Paolo Di Canio, who managed Sunderland between March 2013 and September 2013. The shortest reign on this list, Di Canio managed Sunderland for 13 games, but immediately made himself a hero by beating Newcastle 3-0 at St James's Park, a day that Sunderland fans still talk about today. That was one of just three wins for Di Canio while in charge of the club, who after keeping them in the Premier League, oversaw wholesale changes at Sunderland during the summer, bringing in 14 new players as well as selling key members of the squad and alienating other senior figures. The Italian really ruffled feathers at the Stadium of Light and cited the problems that still lie at the club today, but his erratic tactics and failure to get results made him an accident waiting to happen, and Sunderland correctly got shot of Di Canio just nine games into the season. Di Canio realised the problem at Sunderland, he just wasn't the man to solve them. Next up was Gus Poyet, who managed Sunderland between October 2013 and March 2015. Much like Di Canio, Poyet quickly endeared himself to the fans, beating Newcastle in his second game in charge, his first of three consecutive Tyneweir derby triumphs. The Uruguayan had Sunderland playing a passing style that maybe didn't suit them, but he also guided them to a League Cup final, where they were beaten by Man City. With their league form still bleak, Poyet stated they needed a miracle to survive. Well, miracles do happen, and the Black Cats went on to pick up 13 points from a possible 15 as they achieved survival with the game to spare. The following season, Poyet's men were unable to recapture the spirit that kept them in the Premier League, and with another relegation battle looming, Poyet was sacked in March 2015. Would another miracle have occurred under Poyet? Probably not, and the fans weren't enjoying his brand of football, but he was probably the only manager during this period who gave Sunderland a clear identity. It's just a shame he couldn't put his methods into practice, so it was the correct decision to go in a different direction. Dick Advocat came in next, managing Sunderland between March 2015 and October 2015. The elderly Dutchman was brought in on a short-term basis to keep Sunderland in the Premier League, and he did exactly that, being reduced to tears as his side avoided the drop. The fans begged him to stay and sent his wife flowers, so Advocat did stay, but not for long. After a terrible start of the following season, despite a plethora of new arrivals at the club, Advocat resigned with the club's second from bottom. The problem with the Advocat was, there was no longevity or chance of stability because of his age, and he was hardly going to be managing Sunderland deep into his 70s. It was a short term solution and should have stayed as such, and he resigned before things got even worse. The next manager was Sam Allardyce, who managed Sunderland between October 2015 and July 2016. The one that got away for the Wearsiders, Sunderland fans still shake their fists with anger at the FA for taking away Sam Allardyce. Despite a win over Newcastle, shock, 
Allardyce initially struggled to change things up at the Stadium of Light, and it was only when he got to the January transfer window that he was able to get things going, signing Wabi Kazri, Lamin Kone and Jan Kirchhoff. The new signings revitalised the side, and they avoided relegation with a game to spare, sending Newcastle down to the Championship in the process. The fans were excited for a steady future under Allardyce, until the England job came calling, and the big man was off. Allardyce was the only manager that looked like really stabilising things at Sunderland, and the appointment by the FA continues to haunt the club, made even worse considering he only lasted one game with the three Lions. Up next it was David Moyes, who was in charge between July 2016 and May 2017. Stick with me Sunderland fans, I know this wound is still fresh. Moyes was a shadow of his former self by the time he arrived in the North East. The Scot was negative from the off, but wasn't backed by Ellis Short either, which all contributed to a bleak attempt to avoid relegation. Sunderland had a habit of changing their manager late in the season to help them stay up, but they decided to stick with Moyes last season and it just ended with them finishing bottom of the Premier League without even looking like surviving. Moyes had disenchanted the fans and absolutely deserved the sack, but supporters will have wished it came sooner. And finally we've got Simon Grayson, who managed Sunderland between June 2017 and October 2017. To be fair, the bloke didn't have a chance. The fans were still hurting from the year before and desperate for new ownership, while Ellis Shaw wouldn't back Grayson at all, meaning the new manager had to scrape the bargain bin for new faces. Sunderland's losing mentality didn't disappear under Grayson, and while he wasn't the root of the problems, things were never going to get better with him in charge. Grayson was rightly sacked, but is there anyone realistically who can come in and save Sunderland? So those are the past 8 Sunderland managers and whether or not they deserve the sack. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and who you think will be the next Sunderland boss. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.